So the pictures here are of Lerin near Foy in Cornwall and Kerry Kerry in New Zealand, both of which feature in what I'm going to say. Mary Broad's historical experience was extraordinary by any account. She was one of few women convicted for highway robbery in Georgian Devon, transported on the first fleet to New South Wales, where she absconded by boat with her husband, William Bryant, two young children and seven fellow convicts, all of whom survived a 69 day voyage to Timor in an open boat. After the escapees were detained, Mary Broad or Bryant lost her husband and both her children to illnesses. She was returned to Britain, where her case attracted the active support of James Boswell to obtain her pardon and release. Mary Broad then came home to some of her family in Cornwall. It's a story which has been told many times. Leaving aside fiction and invention, there are two new elements revealed by my research, both of which relate to Mary Broad's family and relations in Cornwall. The first is the identification of Mary Broad's parental family and origins. And the second is Mary Broad's influence and legacy after she returned home. In the mid 1790s, two of her relations traveled from Cornwall to the South Seas and New South Wales, where one later returned to settle with his family, also living for some years in New Zealand. And because what I have to say includes um, new historical research, which is factual, I'm going to present it um, as a documentary narrative um, without reference to the other published accounts um, in order to just uh, tell the story as it appears in the historical evidence. For everyone who chooses to write and talk about Mary Broad, um, in some ways she is a blank screen. Like two thirds of women in Cornwall who married in the 1780s, Mary Broad could not read or write. She made her mark. The historical evidence contains very few statements of how Mary Broad felt or what she thought. And all of these were mediated by another person, made in letters that James Boswell and Mary's brother-in-law, Edward Pucky, wrote on her behalf, recorded in the memorandums of fellow convicts or journals and memoirs of those who came into contact with her in the course of their work, including a journalist who wrote a court report for the London Chronicle in July, 1792. And apart from these accounts, the only historical evidence is of Mary Broad's actions, what she chose to do, often in circumstances which had not been chosen by her, and there are some gaps um, in that history. But we do now have access to a wide range of records and digitized images. What I'm showing here are Mary Broad's marks in February 1798 and in February, May and November 1794. Marks aren't signatures, but looking at the top and the bottom images, I think it is possible to see the similarity between the marks um, that Mary Broad made when she married in New South Wales in February 1788, and when she endorsed a receipt for five pounds in Cornwall in November 1794. Looking at the two images in the middle, the February 1794 image um, has the initials with which Boswell had asked her to mark letters written on her behalf. And the May 1794 receipt was a handwritten copy enclosed in a letter to Boswell rather than the original. And it's partly thanks to James Boswell and his attorney's habits as a notary that it was possible to reconstruct Mary Broad's family origins. Boswell's papers in 1793 refer to Mary Broad's aged father in Cornwall, her sister Elizabeth, who was married to Edward Pucky, a tailor in Foy, her sister Dolly, who was employed as a cook in London, a brother Joseph, who was living in London, and the prospect of a family inheritance which a letter from Edward Pucky to Boswell identified in February 1794 as a Pope family legacy. And from this information, it's possible to historically identify Mary Broad as the granddaughter of Prudence Pope, who had married Josiah Broad of St. Neard. Mary's father as their eldest son, William Broad, who was aged 84 in 1793, when Mary was aged 28. Mary's mother as William's wife, Dorothy Julith, 
who had died aged 50 in 1778, when Mary was aged 13. And William and Dorothy Broad's daughters, Elizabeth, who was born in 1756 and married Edward Pucky, Mary, who was born in 1765, and Dorothy, who was born in 1769. Mary's father, William Broad, was identified as of St. Neot when he married. In the 1750s, William worked and traded with his brother Matthew as woodsmen or colliers, commercially leasing and coppicing woodland and selling the timber, fuel and bark. Woodsmen sometimes built and temporarily occupied cabins in the woods where they were working. In 1754, William acquired a long lease to a farm at Bradock or Broad Oak, which remained in his and then his eldest son's ownership until 1828. Four of William and Dorothy's children were christened at Bradock. Um, after which parish records show that they moved, probably following William's trading activities, to Land Livery, where Mary was christened in 1765, probably to Lerin, with broad baptisms at St. Winnow in 1767, and of Dorothy at St. Phoebe in 1769. And they probably traded it at least partly in Foy, where Mary's mother Dorothy was buried in 1778, and Mary's eldest sister Elizabeth married Edward Pucky in the following year. Mary Broad's family circumstances can be compared with those of another local family named Clift. Edward Puckey's brother James, who was a carpenter, married Elizabeth Court, whose sister Joanna was married to a journeyman miller, Robert Clift. The children of Robert and Joanna Clift wrote letters to each other as adults, which refer to the Puckies, their uncle James, their aunt Betty, um, their cousins um, who lived in Foy. And like Mary's sister Dolly, the younger Elizabeth and Joanna Cliff were employed as domestic servants. After Mary Broad's mother died and her eldest sister married, she may have kept house aged 14 for her father and brothers living at home and younger sister Dolly, all being employed by others. By 1783, Edward and Elizabeth Pucky had moved to Plymouth. Mary Broad, by then aged 18, may have moved to work in Plymouth or visited the Puckies there in 1785, when she was aged 20. Mary Broad was committed to prison by the Mayor of Plymouth in July 1785 to stand trial for highway robbery and exercises with two other women. The popular image of highway robbery is of riders wielding pistols and stopping stagecoaches. And some Georgian women were charged as members of gangs, robbing coaches or riders. But highway robbery was also a charge used for many urban street robberies in which force or threats of violence played a part. In London in the 1780s, women against whom highway robbery charges were brought were mostly one woman robbing one other person. One in 10 of these cases had two female defendants indicted for highway robbery of another woman. And there were no cases in which three female defendants were ind indicted for highway robbery of a woman. While that shows that Georgian highway robbery was sometimes a female crime, the indictment of three women for the highway robbery of Agnes Lakeman in Plymouth does not fit into a frequent pattern of court cases at the time in rural Devon, nor in urban London. And the three women, Mary Broad, Catherine Pryor, and Mary Hyden, were indicted for, and I quote, feloniously assaulting Agnes Lakeman spinster in the King's Highway, feloniously putting her in corporal fear and danger of her life in the said highway, and feloniously and violently taking from her person and against her will in the said highway, one silk bonnet valued 12 pence and other goods valued one pound 11 shillings her property. And I wanted to try and find out who Agnes Lakeman was. There was one um, Agnes Lakeman living in Plymouth at the time. Uh, she had moved to Plymouth as a single pa parent where her baby died in March 1782, and Agnes Lakeman herself died a decade later in December 1793. The later date and other circumstances fit closely with a published narrative in which the vicar of the church where Agnes Lakeman and her daughter are buried describes his pastoral care of a dying woman who worked as a prostitute, a woman who had sex outside of marriage as a young woman and had been forced by her father to leave the family home and who turned to prostitution to live, who told the vicar many, many times, sir, 
Have I drowned myself in drunkenness to drive away reflection? The vicar was Robert Hawker, who completed a medical apprenticeship in Plymouth and worked briefly as a naval surgeon before matriculating at Magdalen College, Oxford and being ordained. Hawker's article made it clear that the history of this woman is a real history. The article was published in the Evangelical magazine, which was founded and edited by Reverend John Eyre, who's pictured here, whose father and brothers were manufacturers and traders in Cornwall, and who returned to Bodmin in the summer of 1793 to visit his dying father. Hawker, whose grandson was the future Cornish poet Robert Stevens Hawker, later reworked this woman's story, producing versions in verse and song which was published as illustrated here in the Evangelical magazine in 1808. And it was then taken up by the London Female Mission and continued to be republished and reprinted and was later issued as a Victorian tract. Mary Broad was committed in July, 1785. She was imprisoned in Plymouth and then moved to Exeter where the next assizes were held in the following March of 1786. Convicted and sentenced to death, Mary Broad's sentence was commuted to seven years transportation. She may have expected to remain in prison in Exeter, given that transportations to America had been largely on hold since the American War of Independence. In Exeter, Mary Broad was in prison with, with Elizabeth Baker, a married woman whose husband accompanied her and who was pregnant and gave birth in prison. In the summer after Mary Broad's trial, the decision was made to develop a penal colony at Brockney Bay. By September 1786, Mary Broad had moved to the Dunkirk prison hall moored at Hermose in Plymouth, with the capacity for over 300 convicts, many on sentences of transportation, and guarded by Marines. This is actually a late 18th century view of Plymouth Dock, um, and the large institutional building was the Marine Barracks. In December 1786, Mary Broad conceived her first child, almost certainly by Mr Spence, whose surname she gave to her daughter as a middle name. And there were several families named Spence living in Plymouth, which included men working as a waterman, a victualler, and a former Marine sergeant, any of whom might have had occasion to visit the Dunkirk. And there was also a convict named Daniel Spencer, who was held on Dunkirk, and who later signed his name as Spence when he witnessed the wedding in New South Wales. It was not possible to confirm whether one of these was the father of Mary Broad's child, and whether or not the father was aware of the pregnancy at the time. In March 1787, Mary Broad was embarked on the Charlotte transport, which was part of the First Fleet to New South Wales. Her daughter was born on the 8th of September, shortly after the First Fleet left Rio de Janeiro, and Mary named her daughter Charlotte Spence Broad. Mary Broad was disembarked at Port Jackson, in February 1788, with her five-month-old daughter. Four days later, Mary Broad married William Bryant. One of the earliest wedding ceremonies conducted at Port Jackson in February 1788. As a married couple, the Bryants were able to build and live in their own separate family hut, rather than sharing accommodation with other fellow transportees. William Bryant had also been held under Dunkirk and sailed on the Charlotte, where he was trusted to issue victuals to the over 100 convicts. He was a fisherman and he was soon trusted to take out boats and fish at Port Jackson and allowed to keep some of the catch for his family. In fact, a hut was provided for the Bryant family, possibly because of the hours that William was out at sea fishing. Mary Broad's experience growing up with woodsmen living temporarily in cabins her family's farm, the Foy River and coastal fisheries, all stood her in good stead to adapt to living at Port Jackson when it was first established as an encampment and then developed and built out as a settlement. Mary Broad and her family had a better diet and accommodation than many fellow transportees. But these privileges were temporarily interrupted in February 1789 after William Bryant was found to have been privately selling fish, so he was allowed to keep some of the catch back for his family, but he kept back more than that and was selling it privately. Um, and his privileges, was, his privileges were removed, but they were restored. And in April 1790, the Bryant's son, Emmanuel, was born. 
I'm going to condense very briefly here the events of 1791 to two. On the 28th of March, 1791, Mary Broad left Port Jackson in an open boat with seven fellow transportees, her husband and her two children who were then aged three and one. The escapees included experienced mariners who had some navigational instruments. They broadly followed the route established by Captain Cook. From Port Jackson, they traveled north and stayed close to the coast, landing to collect fresh water and food. In the Gulf of Carpentaria, they initially stayed close to the coast, but changed course after seeing two large canoes with 30 to 40 men on each. Finally, they crossed the open sea before landing at Kupang in West Timor, which was then Dutch territory, on the 5th of June, 1791. Despite having an agreed cover story, it was only a matter of time before the Dutch governor became aware that his visitors had absconded from Port Jackson. They were imprisoned and then handed over to the next British naval captain, Edward Edwards, who arrived at Kupang with other survivors following a shipwreck. After contracting a Dutch ship, Edwards took charge of the detainees on the 5th of October, 1791. One month later, they arrived at Batavia where 20 month old Emmanuel and his father, William Bryant, both sickened and died in December, 1791. At Batavia, Mary Broad was then embarked on, um, for the voyage home with her four year old daughter. At the Cape, the remaining five detainees and child were transferred to the HMS Gorgon in March, 1792. The deaths of one in four of the children traveling on board HMS Gorgon were attributed by one Marine to the extreme heat off the west coast of Africa. Mary Broad's daughter, Charlotte, was one of those who died and was buried at sea, five weeks before HMS Gorgon anchored at Portsmouth. The five detainees from Botany Bay were then taken to Newgate in London. They appeared before magistrates at Bow Street where it was ordered that they should complete their original sentences. In London, James Boswell um, took an interest in the case. He read news um, reports of the Bow Street hearing in July, 1792. He was in, then in contact with Justice Bond who had heard the detainee's case and he probably visited the convicts in Newgate at that time. He made petitions on their behalf and called offices to follow these up. And Boswell delayed his departure for a six week visit to Cornwall with his daughters in the summer of 1792 to lobby the Secretary of State with whom he'd been at university. And he continued to be in contact um, with the Secretary of State's office after his return from Cornwall. The story of the convict's escape and voyage was told and retold from the early 1790s onwards. There were official reports as well as personal memoirs of many individuals who had sailed with the first fleet were present at Port Jackson or came into contact with the returning detainees. Their court appearances in London were reported in newspapers and journals with the Universal magazine claiming in the year before Mary Broad was pardoned that the resolution displayed by the woman is hardly to be paralleled. At one time their anchor broke and the surf was so great that the men laid down their oars in a state of despair and gave themselves up as lost. But this Amazon, taking one of their hats, cried out, never fear, and immediately began to exert herself in clearing the boats of water. Mary Broad was pardoned and was the first to be released in May 1793, seven years after her sentence had been commuted to transportation. Mary Broad's London lodgings on Little Titchfield Street were near James Boswell's house on Great Portland Street and his brother's home on Titchfield Street. Mary Broad's expenses were paid by Boswell, who began to make efforts to raise donations for Mary Broad after she was pardoned and released. The new war with revolutionary France and its fiscal demands preoccupied public attention. There were many charitable causes, alongside which Boswell's claims on behalf of a runaway, albeit retrospectively pardoned felon, might be dismissed as eccentric, untimely and undeserving. Boswell asked his friend in Cornwall, Reverend William Johnson Temple, the vicar of St. Cluvius, to raise funds for Mary Broad. Buoyed by his recent experience of successful fundraising for Roman Catholic priests who had fled revolutionary France, Temple agreed, promising Boswell that I will endeavour to procure some subscriptions 
I have obtained near £25 from the French clergy by subscribers to Miss Moore's admirable pam pamphlet. Despite being willing to fundraise in Cornwall for Mary Broad, when he next wrote to Boswell on the 18th of July, 1793, Temple voiced only frustrations. Evidently, Temple was finding it difficult to present Mary Broad as a deserving cause to individuals in Cornwall who thought that they knew her family. Temple wrote that he had made inquiry about your heroine's family and find they are eminent for sheep stealing. I wish I could make a collection for her here, but I've just levied about 30 pounds for the French refugee clergy by means chiefly of Miss Moore's pamphlet. Broad was not an uncommon surname. Defendants named Broad featured on the session and the size lists placed before jurors, magistrates and judges in Cornwall and Devon at hearings that were sometimes reported in newspapers. On the day that Mary Broad's, Broad's trial was held at the Exeter Assizes, a William Broad of Heavy Tree in Devon was, was tried for killing a sheep with the intention of stealing the, the carcass. Five months earlier at the court sessions in Bodmin, Mary's father or brother, William Broad of Braddock, had pleaded guilty to assault and paid a sixpenny fine. Judges, magistrates, jurors and vicars were not necessarily informed whether or how individuals with the same surname were or were not related to each other. Temple wrote kindly to Boswell that Mary Broad was a heroine of the ocean whose perils and escape exceed the fictions of poetry. But one of very few narratives reportedly expressing the feelings of Mary Broad was a grotesque satire in verse by William Parsons, written as though it was a letter from Mary Broad in Cornwall to James Boswell in London. And this drew attention to James Boswell's earlier affair with a former prisoner in Newgate, Margaret Rudd. And it referred to Boswell's friends providing financial support for Mary Broad, possibly reflecting genuine annoyance at Boswell's misjudged demands. Temple knew his local community well when he voiced doubts that he would be able to raise money for Mary Broad in Cornwall in 1793. Nonetheless, he was able to call on the help of fellow Cornish vicars to maintain contact with Mary Broad. John Barron, the vicar of Lost Withiel, received and passed on Boswell's gift to Mary Broad. Wyman Corey, the vicar of Gollant, who lived in Foy, made inquiries about how Mary Broad was and reported back to John Barron. Henry Harvey, who was the vicar of St. Phoebe, reported in April 1794 that Mary Broad had been living in his parish for the last six months since her arrival from London. Six months later, Mary Broad made her mark on what was to be the final receipt for a gift of five pounds from James Boswell. Mary Broad had family living in Foy, where Edward Pucky worked as a tailor, at St. Neot, where her uncle Richard Broad farmed, at Braddock, where her father died, aged 87 in 1796, at Beconnock, where her brother William had married Anne Bryant. And Mary may have been living with another brother, John Broad of St. Phoebe, who occupied property at Lerin. After Mary returned to Cornwall, the Puckies and John and Elizabeth Broad of St. Veep named their next baby girls Mary, possibly um, as a tribute to the return of Mary Broad. What Mary Broad did after 1794 when she was aged 29 is an unsolved mystery. Where she lived, how she spent her time, whether she worked and her source of income if she did not, whether she married again and had further children, whether she stayed in Cornwall, migrated within Britain or emigrated, and when she died are all un unknown at the time of writing this presentation. In Cornwall and elsewhere, there were many individuals named Mary Broad or Mary Bryant, some of whom married, took their husband's surname and had children. Nonetheless, Mary Broad's return to Cornwall had an evident impact on some of her relations. It was Edward Pucky who exchanged letters with James Boswell. And like Edward Pucky, his brother James and nephews, um, James or Jimmy and William or Bill, lived in Foy. And James, Jimmy and Bill were carpenters. Jimmy and Bill Pucky may have remembered Mary Broad from the early 1780s. Although Mary Broad was their aunt's sister, she was closer in age to Jimmy and Bill than to James or Edward Pucky. Mary Broad was aged 28 when she returned home. In 1793, Jimmy Pucky was aged 22 and Bill Pucky was aged 17. Jimmy and Bill Pucky had been born in the 1770s. They would have grown up knowing about the voyages of Captain Cook, 
The family of William Bly originated from St. Hugh in Cornwall, and the Puckies would have heard or, or, or read about Bly's voyage to Otterhite or Tahiti and the mutiny on the bounty. The development of the convict colony at Port Jackson meant that more British mariners and others were traveling from New South Wales. And the fact that several of the first fleet ships embarked convicts, marines and crews at Plymouth meant it was an experience which felt close to home. At the same time, few young men had the opportunity to meet and talk to a relation who had returned home to Cornwall from Botany Bay. And after making a unique journey from Port Jackson to Timor in a six all open boat. The Puckies may have read the London Chronicle report of Mary Broad's daring escape from Port Jackson. Directly or indirectly, after Mary Broad returned home, Jimmy and Bill Pucky would have heard tales of this eventful voyage and the people she met and saw on her journey. As young men who were about to establish their own independent lives, living in Foy, which had mainly coastal and fisheries trade in the decade of peace with France, Jimmy and Bill Pucky probably felt that they would like to travel overseas and to see more of the world themselves. Yet as Britain went to war with revolutionary France in 1793, neither joined the Royal Navy or Army. By 1796, the brothers were working as carpenters in Falmouth. In Foy and in Falmouth, there were dissenting ministers who associated themselves with the London Missionary Society. Leading figures in the London Missionary Society, Reverend Thomas Hawes and Reverend John Eyre, originated from Cornwall and had family living at Bodmin and near Newquay. The schoolmaster and preacher, John Jefferson of Foy, joined the first London Missionary Society mission, to which Reverend Wildbore of Falmouth also recommended the Pucky brothers. James Pucky impressed interviewers, partly because he convinced them that he had practical knowledge and skills. As well as being a carpenter, he took maps and charts with him to the interview, and he had experience of teaching in an evening school in Falmouth, possibly as an assistant in the school which was associated with Wild Boar's church. The Pucky brothers were accepted to join the first mission as artisans and sailed on the duff. They were accompanied by Reverend John Jefferson, who was ordained in London shortly before they left, and by John Cott from Penzance, who was also a carpenter with whom the Puckies had worked in Falmouth. And what I'm saying there is that there were four individuals of Cornish, who would be identified as of Cornish origin um, who sailed on the Duff on the first London Missionary Society mission to Tahiti. On Tahiti, um, uh, the, the Pucky brothers and John Cock constructed accommodation for the mission and William Pucky also built a boat. Both remained with the mission on Tahiti when the Duff left. Later, the Puckies and John Cock were among those who sailed on the Nautilus for New South Wales, where Governor Hunter agreed to accept the London Missionary Society missionaries as settlers. And it was that journey um, on the Nautilus from Tahiti to New South Wales, which um, took uh, James and William Pucky to Port Jackson, where their aunt had been. Um, Reverend John Jefferson, um, when, when the Puckies went to um, Port Jackson, Reverend John Jefferson remained on Tahiti until his death in 1807, where he completed some lang language work, which is extant. In New South Wales, the Puckies and John Cock worked on the construction of a house for the governor's nephew, Lieutenant Kent, which was later the first orphanage and orphan school building in Sydney. John Cock in December 1798 and William Puckey in July 1799 uh, took the opportunity to leave Port Jackson with the intention of returning home to Britain. In the summer of 1801, William Puckey called on his cousin, William Clift, in London. Clift reported lightheartedly to his sister, Betty, in September that about 10 weeks ago, William Puckey was in town for several weeks. He came up as a mate to a vessel from Falmouth. He was very well and came to see us several times. His brother, James, is still at Port Jackson in Botany Bay, and has turned builder of ships and houses, which they found to be the most profitable. In fact, James Puckey had by then failed to prosper in Port Jackson. James Puckey may have been seeking to establish himself commercially as his brother suggested. He completed one journey to New Zealand to load spars for Bengal and was then appointed to a salaried government position as a master carpenter, from which he was dismissed in January 1801 for a constant neglect of duty. He may then have decided to work his passage home to Britain. In 
He embarked the same month on a second merchant ship to load spars in New Zealand for Bengal. After this ship called in for repairs, it was seized because it was a Spanish prize which had been um, captured. And James Pucky spent a year as a prisoner of war and then died aged uh, 32 on his homeward journey. After he returned to Cornwall, William Pucky married and worked on coastal traders sailing between Falmouth and London for 15 years. From 1807, some of the convict transports um, for New South Wales were embarked from Falmouth in Cornwall. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, William Pucky and his wife Marjorie or Margaret Gilbert left Cornwall for New South Wales with their children, traveling as passengers on the Bering convict transport. And one of their two daughters died on the outward journey. In New South Wales, William Pucky renewed his contact with the missionaries who had settled there. William Pucky's family obtained a land grant of 100 acres at Parramatta, where Reverend Samuel Marsden later invited Pucky to join him on a mission to New Zealand, which the Pucky family did. Pucky joined teams completing exploratory surveys for the mission, which included some maritime coastal soundings. He helped to establish and build the mission at Kerry Kerry including the mission ship, the Herald. William and Marjorie Pucky returned to Sydney on the Herald in 1826, where they lived in the district known as the Rocks. Their daughter married a Scot, who was captain of the Herald. Both the Pucky's adult children then lived in New Zealand, where their son, William Gilbert Pucky, became well known as a minister and as a Maori translator. But something went wrong for the elder William and Marjorie Pucky, who died in Sydney in November and December 1827, with the cause of both deaths being listed as alcoholism. In 1836, Edward Pucky, Mary Broad's nephew, who was a tailor like his father, died in Cape Town, where he had married a few years before. The research I've been talking about um, was published as a book last year, it is a documentary narrative and not a drama. It focuses on the historical evidence. And you are welcome um, to ask me any questions about the research and how it relates to other accounts of Mary Broad's life story.